What is metaphorical truth? I've heard the phrase being used online by some of the public intellectuals out there, but there seems to be some confusion between them in the various definitions that they're using. So I'll, I'll try to foster a sort of artificial conversation between a few of them to hopefully help figure things out. Let's start with the evolutionary biologist Brett Weinstein, since he coined the term. We tend to think of intellect has evolved uh, has, as having evolved because knowing what's true gives you an advantage. But there's actually nothing that says that the literal truth is where advantage lies. And so uh, I have a category that I call literally false, metaphorically true. These are ideas that aren't true in the factual sense, but they are true enough that if you behave as if they were true, you come out ahead of where you would be if you behaved according to the fact that they're not true. So let me give you a couple of trivial examples that won't be controversial. Porcupines can throw their quills. It's not true. However, if you live near porcupines and you imagine that porcupines can throw their quills, you'll give them some space. If you don't, you may realize that they can't throw their quills, get really close to one, and it may wheel around and nail you with a porcupine quill, which can be extremely dangerous because they are microscopically designed to move in from where they puncture you over time and they can puncture a vital organ or you can get an infection. So the person who believes that a porcupine can throw their quills has an advantage that isn't predicated on the fact that this is actually a literal truth, right? So a metaphorical truth is a belief that is literally false, but it still enhances one's evolutionary fitness if this belief is put into practice. Another good modern example that he's used before is the treat every firearm as if it is loaded rule. It's a false belief, but because there is a great risk in accidentally injuring or killing someone from carelessness, this applied fiction is adopted in order to avoid needless harm. And of course, there's the natural objection made by Joe Rogan here. Is the so, problem using the term true like when sometimes you should use the term fact? Like, yeah, like yes. one plus one is two, that is a fact. One plus one is two is also true. You throw some water on a match, that is, and it will go out. That's a fact. Yes. Right? Well, as I see it, at least, there is this overarching truth, the one that Sam Harris was pointing to, the one I think you're pointing to also, and the one I, I'm imagining we all subscribe to. Sure. Right? There is the testable truth that reveals itself in the laboratory or in a careful experiment in the field. And that really is the top level truth. But then there are the truths you can't speak yet. Now, the Eastern Orthodox icon carver, Jonathan Peugeot, weighs in as a response to this. Now, did you notice what just happened here? So beyond the, the, uh, the slightly condescending tone of wanting to attribute his opinion about scientific truth to everyone in the room as if obviously we all agree that scientific truth is the top level truth is the overarching truth I mean uh, it's so obvious that he would not dare to think one so simple-minded as to uh, consider anything else and uh, then he it's funny because he kind of does a double take looking at Jordan because that is exactly the point Jordan has been arguing against with Sam Harris but beyond that, can you spot the supreme irony? Because the only way he can make his point about the superiority of testable truth that reveals itself in the laboratory uh, is by using a metaphorically true but factually false, <laughs> using his own uh, structure to say it. So he, so he has to say that this testable truth is top level truth but you know I, I looked for hours on that top shelf and I couldn't find it <laughs> but the second one is better because he says that factual truth is the overarching truth which which reaches sublime levels of irony and contradiction because well number one uh, obviously if you look over your head you will not see this testable factual truth and number two if we even look at what that means how an overarching truth is precisely a truth in which other truths are embedded. It's not just truth, but it's, you know, the truth of truth, let's say, or the, the structure in which other truths are con contained. And then in his very statements, he embeds factual truth 
within the metaphorically true but factually false language of hierarchy, which is, you know, by using the, the language of up and allusions to heaven and transcendence, it is the very language of religion. So a metaphorical truth for him is a truth in which other truths are embedded. So any statements that use hierarchy or values within them are not scientifically factual statements, but they're instead a metaphorical usage of comparison between human subjectivity and in relation to factual reality. So Peugeot points us back towards the standard definition of metaphor, to relate one thing with another in order to draw attention to a similarity between the two of them. In writing, oftentimes metaphor is used to relate the fictional world to the factual world. For instance, The Crucible by Arthur Miller is on the Salem Witch Trials was used to point out the similarities to the present McCarthyism occurring at that time. Now, speaking of stories, we can look at the aforementioned psychologist and author Jordan Peterson's perspective on truth that he's been trying to articulate for a while now, sometimes referring to what he calls meta-truths. Have a, that's what you do if you're an author, right? Because in a, in a book, you don't want the book exactly to be about what ordinary people do in ordinary times in their life. It's like, you already know how to be ordinary during ordinary times of your life, what, that's not useful. You know, you wouldn't watch a videotape of yourself, imagine you videotaped yourself during a day, and then you, next day you watched that. It's like, God, who would want to do that? So what seems to happen in stories is that they distill, they distill, so they, they watch people, people watch people, and then they tell stories about what they see, but they leave a lot out of those stories. Everything that's boring, hopefully. And then, more and more stories about exciting things get sort of aggregated, and then maybe a great writer comes along and writes something really, really interesting. Profound character transformations. And then you say, well that's fiction. And then you say, well that's not true. Because it's fiction. But then, then maybe that's not right. Maybe it's more than true. So, it's like there's a, there's a, there's waves of, of behavioral patterns that manifest themselves in the crowd across time. The great dramas are played on the crowd across time. And the artists watch that and, and they get intimations of what that is and they write it down and they tell us and then we're a little clearer about what we're up to. You know, like a great dramatist like Shakespeare, let's say, is, we know that what he wrote is fiction, and then we say, well, fiction isn't true. But then you think, well, wait a minute, maybe it's true like numbers are true. You know, numbers are an abstraction from the underlying reality, but no one in their right mind would really think numbers aren't true. You could even make a case that the numbers are more real than the things that they represent, right? Because the abstraction is so insanely powerful. Once you have mathematics, you're just deadly. You can move the world with mathematics, and so it's not obvious that the abstraction is less real than the, than the, than, than the more concrete reality. So, for him, fiction is true like numbers are true. They're an abstraction and a simplification of the underlying reality. And you can think about this in the same way that you might take a Myers-Briggs personality test or something. Out of a large questionnaire, there are similar types of people that will answer the questions in the same way. And from that, you can get a low-resolution personality type. Once you get enough things that share similarities, you can create a category to fit all of those subjects together into a singular frame for understanding. Now, Pete, uh, Peterson has also brought into the point that survival for a creature is a necessary adjudicator for something to be considered truth. As surreptitiously stated following Nietzsche, if it doesn't serve life, it's not true. Which can lead well into the author and philosopher Nassim Taleb's take that I think is relevant to this subject. There's a trader who is a fellow who wrote a book on how I lost a, billion, a million dollars, which at the time when he wrote it was very respectable. A million dollars was a lot of money. Okay, Now, you know, they didn't have uh, Ob the Obama years and Greenspan, the printing. Okay, so how did he lose that million dollars? He... in traded green lumber, and he knew everything about green lumber. He knew the statistics, uh, 
the physics, the chemistry, everything, the supply, the demand, the geography, the consumption. He knew everything about green lumber, read every magazine, every book he could find on lumber. And let, he lost all his money. Turned out there was an epit, a fellow, an old trader, who was very, very wealthy and, and always made money trading green lumber. He traded nothing else. And one day the narrator discovered that that fellow thought that green lumber was not freshly cut lumber, that it was lumber, that they took lumber and painted it green, right? And yet he made a fortune using green lumber. So what does it tell us? It tells us that from the outside, like an academic when approaching a problem, what you need to know, it's not that, it's not what, what, what the fellow who made a lot of money, his name is, I think, Siegel, something like, Jerry Siegel or something like that, was that what he knew was not like, it's not like he didn't know anything. He knew a lot of stuff, but that stuff you can only detect from the inside. You can never know from the outside what it is, you see? You have to play the game be. to understand. You have to play the game to know what you need to know, yeah. okay? From the inside, not from yeah. the outside. But people so the green lumber problem is when you're not realizing which facts are most important in regards to decision making. This mostly fits within Brett's understanding of a metaphorical truth, but it, it, it emphasizes that in certain cases, it's a waste of time and energy to gain a factual understanding of reality if it hinders you in achieving whatever it is that you're aiming at. Factual knowledge is only valuable insofar as it is helpful in attaining a given goal. And that the time it takes you to learn these, this factual knowledge, that it, it, as long as it, that time isn't wasted and maybe come at a cost to survival. Now, uh, Nassim Taleb also brings in uh, a relevant point. Religious statements are not epistemic, scientific, literal claims, but they are risk survival heuristics under incomplete understanding. Populations with the right risk heuristics survive. Others perish. So we organisms operate off of old evolutionary shorthand, certain instinctual heuristics built into us for when our capacity to understand factual reality is limited, such as the heuristic that says, whatever animal you're interacting with that appears larger is therefore more dangerous, or for, for ourselves, if our stomach is stapled smaller, we'll feel more satisfied without having to eat as much. So the specifics be behind why a heuristic actually works only really need to be uncovered in the instance that the, the shorthand the, is failing to remain effective in our given environment. So after going through all of these, I, I think I understand the definitions for these various forms of metaphorical truth as something like a, a simplified conception of a phenomenon or uh, a motto that furthers an end goal that when it's put into action, or a heuristic that is true more often than it is not, or uh, a story composite out of true or factual elements, or an understanding of reality based within and in regards to the values shared by those subject to said reality, or a comparison between multiple things, especially in relation of in relations of value between the two. Now, I realize that these are all somewhat disjointed and not exactly equivalent with each other, but they seem to be pointing in a direction that I think is at least helpful for understanding, which is somewhat funny considering the topic. Now, Joe raises a good point here. Isn't the issue using the word truth? Because we can say, tr we could use tradition and wisdom, and we're okay. But as soon as we start saying truth, then, then we run into problems. I mean, and, and even when you're talking about porcupines, where you're talking about would you say metaphorical truth versus look it's not true it's real simple just don't go near the porcupine teach the kid to not go near the porcupine because porcupine quills are dangerous they get stuck in you they're really dangerous can they throw it at you no they cannot but just stay clear of them because you don't want them to s somehow or another get in touch with your body there's no truth in that they can throw their quills at you you benefit from being particularly aware of the dangers of their quills but if you tell a kid that they can throw their quills and so therefore the kid stays clear of them he has a faulty assumption in his head you're lying to them for their own protection oh, and I, I that's wouldn't. not good so then what is the difference between a literal or objective truth and the metaphorical 
Well, metaphorical truths aren't neutral fact statements about what the world is, such that science gives us, but rather there are implied ends, values, goals within the statements that contain an impetus for action for an organism within them. So the phrases themselves are like tools to help lead to desired outcomes. And in order to arrive at a scientific truth, all subjective feelings or preference about a certain phenomenon are left off of the table, leaving us purely with the objective fact or truth. So are metaphorical truths just scientific claims that have not yet been proven, or maybe in certain cases have already been disproven? For instance, some unsound scientific claims that we might get from reading a text such as the Bible could be the cosmology that it presents, the cosmology that says the earth is flat with water underneath it, that there is a dome above us in the sky which keeps out the water from above, and that the sun goes ar across the sky before entering into the underworld, the horizon. This is essentially the ancient perspective on what the world is or was. And through testing nowadays, we've been able to get a very different picture for what the world actually is. The Earth as a globe, which revolves around the sun. Our world is absolutely tiny in comparison to the rest of the, the, rest of the universe. Read scientifically, the Bible is quite inaccurate. One would have to reject the validity of the Bible's teachings, or instead reinterpret those passages to mean something different to what seems an obvious reading. Now, people exist within differing worldviews for understanding the same facts out there as everyone else. It's interpretation of the facts, essentially. But the frame which one uses to see the facts also reinterprets the facts in order to fit inside that worldview, or else the facts get ignored. Certain facts are only seen through a certain measurement and might not be translatable without having that same shared measuring process or axiom or value. Here's uh, Peterson explaining it in one of his lectures. Well, you can take this infinite set of facts and then you subject it to your filters and you let some of the facts through and they're facts. But what about all the facts that you don't let through? That's the thing. And that's what the gorilla video shows too. It's like, yeah, yeah, you got the basketball count right, but you missed the big primate. And you might say, well, your priorities were a bit skewed in that circumstance because you were rearranging the deck chairs as the Titanic sank, you know, as the, as the old joke goes. And so it's very much useful to, to think always, well, you're, it isn't just your damn opinion that's biased, although it is. It's your perceptions that are biased. So, well, and with your words, it's even more. So you say, well, you can't see the thing in itself because it's too complex. So you perceive it simpler than it is. And some of that perceptual simplification is dependent on your aims. So that's a vicious one because it pulls the, the value structure that you're ensconced within into your perceptions. It pulls it into the realm of facts itself. And then you do another, I think about this as a uh, compression. You know, you can compress a photograph by getting rid of redundant information. That's sort of what you're doing here. So you're like one of these squares, little black squares here, black rectangles, compresses all of those. It's like we're going to treat those as if they're grayish black. Same thing happens here. So we're blurring across them. So we have a much less, higher, a much less high resolution image here. So you take the thing in itself, you perceive it as a low resolution representation, and then you take that low resolution representation and you replace that with a word, and so the word is a twofold compression. And then when someone tosses you the word, you unpack it into the low resolution perception, and then maybe into the world itself if you can do that, but probably not. So that's what we're doing, we're taking the complex world, we fold it into a simple perception, we fold that into a word, we throw the word to someone else and they unpack it. And the only way you can unpack it, of course, is if you've had enough similar experience so that you have the reference for the word already in your experience. So, which is why you have to use simplified language with children, right? Because there's no point tossing a child a concept that he or she can't unpack. Now, there are many different types of frames that we can all use for encapsulating and comprehending the same facts for relation to our specific context 
context dependent lives or, or present needs. The facts don't tell you how to read them. There are many multiple different frames in which you can read a series of facts in order to get an understanding of them. When we use certain frames for only understanding the objective and factual based reality, we might accidentally leave out necessary information just because of the frame that you use to exclude all other information that can't fit within your chosen frame. For instance, you cannot get an accurate measurement of a velocity of a particle without losing your ability to measure the position of that same particle at the same time. You have to choose which one you want to measure before you can get that particular information while losing the chance to learn the other. So now we have another definition of metaphorical truth, a low resolution picture of reality so that you can interact with it. Now, before we can see flaws in a model, we have to use that model. By having a metaphorical understanding of a phenomenon, it, uh, the thing is, when all of the facts aren't yet at hand, all we have is our understanding of what this phenomenon reminds us of. Being very keen pattern finders, we, we might look to a problem and relate it to another problem that we faced before, and so we'll have a low resolution, low resolution and definitely factually inaccurate understanding of this new novel subject. Now, the, the act of creating a model to fit all of the many facts within it isn't exactly a process of analyzation. It's more of a process of imagination. So it's only because we have an inaccurate reading of a phenomenon can we actually learn how the model that we have is incomplete. Because I might treat the phenomenon according to the model that I have in my head, which creates certain expectations for outcomes. And because of that, I automa I'm automatically overlaying a category of anomaly for all things that don't fit within that model, my expectations for what was supposed to occur. These new anomalous facts now rise to a higher weight and value. And, and like they become more important. And, and through what becomes more important, we can determine what we should now look at in order to build a new, more accurate model. A model that contains all of the anomalous new categories that did not fit within the previous model in order to form a new model where these anomalies are fitting within it. It's the stumbling stone for our current models becomes our chief cornerstone in developing new ones. So there's an addendum that we can add to the last definition of metaphorical truth. It's a low resolution picture of reality that you can interact with prior to the accurate development of facts. This goes back to my question earlier. Is a metaphorical truth just an unverified scientific fact? Because in this instance, it is. But creating models is about reality is still distinct from creating ethics for how to act. Now, there's a necessity to create larger abstract understandings of reality to work within because our individual minds are too limited to operate upon a landscape of infinite facts. We create amalgamated facts laden with our shared values in order to, to give us operable conceptions of reality so that we can function within it. Now, Brett has his criticism of metaphorical truths or specifically Jordan Peterson's usage of the biblical wisdom as metaphorical truths. Because these myths are the product of adaptive evolution, they are limited in utility to the circumstances in which they evolved. And because we live in circumstances that don't look anything like the uh, situation of thousands of years ago, we should be suspect of these stories and their relevance to our modern pro problems. So his criticism is that our certain metaphorical truths were dependent upon past environments, or they might even be over-regulating behavior, even though the reasons for that previous regulation in the past are no longer present. And that by using, and now by using our modern understanding of the world with factual reality, we, we have a, we're going to be much more well suited for dealing with our environment because we have that better understanding. Now, Peterson's rebuttal is that an effective heuristic that led to beneficial outcomes in the past 
can become abstracted out from that particular instance in the past and overlaid into our present environments. We can reenact the archetypes within the stories from the past in our present lives in order to hopefully lead to a similar outcome as those past, experience, uh, those past events or stories. Also, he brings up that there are certain abstractions that are so simplified, such as the, the Tao, the dance between order and chaos, that are so applicable to almost all elements to human interactions that or human encounters that they give a quick and easy framework for understanding all new and novel environments that can almost become automatic so that we can know exactly where to go. See, the, the simpler, lower resolution models have a great advantage over anything too complicated for understanding properly. There are certain levels of comprehension caps within our population, and even just within our own children, where having a more simplistic understanding is better for human society than where understanding of reality is limited to only a certain high elite few that have a specific accurate knowledge. Because then there would be a worldview divide split between classes where those at the top understand the truth and those at the bottom are working off a completely different framework that they cannot comprehend the the upper level. Uh, and so having a, a divided worldview leads to divided interactions. So we need heuristics for understanding, and, or actually we need heuristics for dealing with uncertainty. This is where Nassim Taleb points out a great tool for discovering what will survive new environments, that which has already survived for a great deal of time. This is what's known as the Lindy effect. Now, what's also interesting is, uh, uh, actually first, the, the Lindy effect is that which has survived a long time is already resistant to changing environments. And so it's more likely to outlive any newer competitors in whatever field it's in. Uh, because those newer competitors haven't already gone through the resistance training that what's been proven Lindy already has. Now, what's interesting is those that have accurately predicted the future, those that have like prophesied the, uh, and been correct in their prophes prophecies, they're, they're the ones that have a proper metaphorical model for, res for understanding the present and relating it back to the occurrences of the past. So, yeah, it's they, they've, they've been able to see the parallels between what's occurring now and what's occurred before, and they can see the, the outcome from what occurred before is more likely to occur now, and so they'll make predictions and prophesy. Also, what Joe Rogan doesn't get about the, the lie of porcupines can throw their quills, it is it, it contains an aggrandizement of the nature of porcupines so as to better motivate the avoidance of them. Especially when teaching children. If if the factual statements about the dangers of porcupine quills are not enough to instill wariness into the child, then that child might endanger his or herself needlessly. So when communicating to people of, say, a wide range of differing intellects, you, you have to speak at a level comprehensible by all. So to create particularly useful heuristics, nuance, nuance will have to become lost so that the wisdom that's within those heuristics can be passed on most effectively. Now, commands from authority figures, such as heroes from the past or, or, or gods, contain a greater motivating quality to them because we try to emulate people or, or characters that we find admirable and by attributing the useful wisdom in the, of the past into the stories and the words of those figures you find yourself a, a very highly efficient mechanism for exporting useful wisdom on how to act across time so Without having an understanding of facts with hierarchical weights in relation to some ideal, an aim, what is valued, or a shared goal, without any of that, purely objective knowledge leaves you unable to know how to act, including even where to look next in the development of knowledge.
And if the desire is for having the greatest amount of knowledge possible, then we'd have to explore other realms of human understanding than merely scientific in order to gain that uh, attention to understanding where to look. So our, our understanding of the world cannot be based purely on what we know objectively, because that's an unattainable goal, literally. There's much more to knowledge within reality than just what can be known strictly scientifically. So I guess this brings up the question, how might we go about disproving specific metaphorical truths, such as ones that we might believe to be bad? Now, uh, since metaphorical truths are not quite like, they're not quite like scientific claims, where just one instance of the antithesis occurring means you have to throw out the entire claim, and instead, they're more like a heuristic that's right a higher percentage of the time than it is wrong. Showing where a metaphorical truth fails doesn't negate all of the instances where it's already succeeded. It only points out a scenario in which the heuristic is non-applicable. But since metaphorical claims are statements predicated upon value, you can debunk them in a different way. Central values can be argued against by pointing out how we wouldn't like the world, how the world might look if these specific values were carried out to their extreme, or how multiple values that are held come in contradiction with one another, or maybe how the end goal that's implicit within a metaphorical truth claim is actually not achievable by the method proposed uh, by the method of proposed action within said claim. Now, in order to compare and contrast the central values against each other, you must do so in respect to some higher or, or further encompassing value already also held by the person you're trying to persuade. Generally, not just by appealing to facts, since remember, those facts can be reinterpreted, reinterpreted in many different ways, not just according to how your specific worldview uses them. Now, what are some bad mo metaphorical truths? Let's be aware that just because truth is laid out within metaphor, a statement containing an implicit understanding of value, that doesn't under that doesn't automatically mean that a metaphorical truth claim is one that should be followed. The heuristic that power plus privilege equals racism is a highly effective tool. The thing is, it's a highly effective tool for creating rationally justified hatred between groups of people. <laughs> that doesn't mean that we should want that outcome. Anyway, we might not be able to show how a metaphorical truth isn't desirable just by pointing to any particular instances of it going wrong, but instead by showing how what we thought might be good outcomes are actually bad outcomes, and essentially showing how the maxim in its universal purpose is, in fact, bad, and that then changes our framework for looking at X in this scenario. Now, Nietzsche did so regarding the metaphorical Christian truth of by faith ye shall be saved, by showing how it's completely incentivizing the wrong ideas about what is thought to be good. He begins by making the case that uncovering truth requires sacrifice and suffering. And since the retention of faith gives one freedom from suffering, faith stands in the way of developing truth. He succinctly puts it, faith saveth, consequently it lies. Now, let's look at some other negative metaphorical truths, such as those laid out by moral psychologist Jonathan Haidt. The three great untruths, as he calls them, residing within many American college campuses today, from his book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Uh, these untruths are something like, we must avoid that which makes us feel threatened. My subjective experience cannot be argued against. And the world is divided by good people and evil people. Now, Haidt and Lukianov, uh, Lukianov point out how these untruths emerge out of a culture of safetyism, the central value or idea that people should never have to experience anything unpleasant, and that they must be protected from this as much as possible. These metaphorical truths come at a great cost to social interactions, where people are fired for making a social taboo, or hunted down for not conforming to the demands of the oppressed. That's the thing. Any value centrally held comes at the cost of sacrificing whatever stands in the way of the furthering of that central value. That central value is our focal point for morally interpreting the world. Now, let's, let's consider the objections raised from the realists, such as Sam Harris. 
by looking at some of the problems with metaphorical truths. And there are things that are not worth knowing. There are things that are dangerous to know. There are things that we'll never know and wish we could know, but we could be surprised about the consequences of knowing them, and they could turn out to kill us in the end, right? I mean, so every variant of that is possible to say, which is to say true, but our concept of the truth value of any given statement can't be held hostage to its ultimate result for the survival of the species in the end. Yes, I, I think it can. That's where we disagree. I could be sitting in a room in my house and say, well, there's no fire in this, in this room, and the rest of the house could be on fire. And it's factually true that there's no fire in this room, but as a theory, it's a pretty stupid one. That's just an incomplete and a consequentially incomplete description of your situation. But you're when you well, that's exactly my point, though. So, Sam's point is that if two truths are both effective at retaining the survival of a species, but both truths are contradictory with one another, then if through pragmatism we would have no mechanism of comparing or evaluating those truths against each other, especially since we have no specific falsification method other than the extinction of the species, which by the time that outcome arises, it's already already too late to make any changes. So by having a scientific understanding of the world, truth is truth whether or not it is actually good for you. With realism, we can delineate the differences between fact and utility, but within the framework of pragmatism, we can't make that distinction. And this is certainly true, and perhaps it's a crucial death blow against pragmatism. But there is the problem that it still raises the problem of why ought we to value truth if it has no relation to furthering my values as a subjective creature or as a, a creature that is risk of death or extinction of a species. Peterson might say that facts might not always be true if they leave out necessary information regarding action, to which he means facts might not to be valued outside of their effectiveness at retaining the survival of the species such as his example of a person sitting within a burning building. And Sam points out, this is a failure of too small of a frame of measurement, which is exactly Peterson's point. There are narrower and broader perspectives of context for how much information is to be fit into each factual truth claim. Because every time you take a measurement, you're also excluding all other forms of analysis and reading the world according to a single principle at a time. Sometimes the information that we don't know can be fatal, and that which we leave out of the picture is what kills us. So we need a method of dealing with existential risk when we are uncertain of all the facts. This is when we need heuristics. Now, Brett also brings up a similar good point as Sam Harris here. So what do you do where religious traditions and what I'm calling metaphorical truths conflict? So let's say mating systems. I would argue that monogamy is a superior mating system because it does not sideline any significant population of males. If you sideline a significant population of males by having uh, what biologists would call a polygynous system or people would generally call a polygamous system, if you do that, then you have sexually frustrated males who are left over and inevitably become something like a marauding horde or an army or something immoral like that. Now, wait, wait. Now, you're assuming that's bad. Yes. And so you're falling into Jonathan's trap because you're saying, you see, you have this a priori framework that monogamy is better because you've already decided what constitutes bad. You can't help but lay a moral framework over your selection of facts. And so that, I mean, I'm not trying to trap you. I know this is a crazily complicated problem. Yeah. But, but the idea that you, that, that the fundamental idea is that you can't select the damn facts and order them, which you have to do. You have to do it without applying an a priori moral framework. Right. So I would say I am applying an a priori moral framework. I am not treating this as a, I mean, you know, we could also look at the behavior of people as a physical process. It's equally a physical process as it is a moral behavioral process. 
I'm not doing that. I'm being a human being, and I'm saying from the point of view of values that probably everybody in this room would share, it is not desirable to have sexually frustrated young men roving around being violent because they can't find a mate because some other highly placed males in the society have many mates. That's not a good thing. That's not me speaking factually, that's me speaking morally. But my point is, my point is not that that's what should come out of this conversation. My point is different religions that contain metaphorical truths differ over what a viable reproductive strategy is. In other words, Christianity prioritizes monogamy. Modern Judaism does too, but the Torah does not. So okay, okay. so so how okay. So your claim is that because it's very difficult to adjudicate between competing moral systems that science is preferable with regards to truth claims because there's a way of adjudicating between scientific truths. But I would say the mere fact that it's difficult to adjudicate between competing moral claims doesn't indicate, therefore, that science is a higher truth. It just indicates that science has an advantage when it comes to comparison that ethical systems don't. Right. It doesn't mean that ethical systems are perfect. No, no. I, 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 so this is one of these places where I don't exactly know what I'm running afoul of and why. I think m my brain is built around some sort of model that makes it hard for me to understand why we could possibly be disagreeing over this. My point is, <laughs> you have a thousand different belief systems. They're all built out of metaphorical truths and a certain amount of real truth. Let's just stick science in with the rest of them. It's, it's belief system a thousand and one. Okay, now let's say, well, which of these is best? How are you even going to do that? There's only one of them that has a distinct characteristic. It's number 1001. What's its distinct characteristic? It explains why all the others work. So how is it not, just by virtue of the fact that it does something that nothing else can, how is it not the top one in the hierarchy? <laughs> so Brett's point is that multiple useful fictions can lead to the same result. But scientific truth is the best system because it establishes just how and why it is that the metaphorical systems actually work. This is the only framework for knowledge that we can get a peek behind the curtain, behind all the metaphorical wisdom out there, and establish the actual mechanisms at play. Now, of course, science is not prescriptive, nor can it be, but it can determine the end results of things, insofar as the subject is an already studied phenomenon. So Brett is right that science is a fantastic framework in comparison to the others because science can determine the reasons behind functionality. However, as pointed out by Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Pajot, the end results of actions do not tell you the value of the actions. Only by relying upon your a priori moral framework culturally embedded within you can you describe those results as being either beneficial or detrimental because it requires some sort of subjective understanding of which it of what is good in order to determine whether those ends match with our conception or not we even further we need to have a conception of desired outcome before we can even begin to wor use any words like work function adaptive properly best or even effective or any words like those those words don't mean anything if they're not in reference to a specific, already recognized end goal. Now, what I don't think many people understand is that there is a severe limitation in communicability when adopting belief system 1001. Methodological naturalism leaves off a primary component to reality, which is consciousness and the ideas and values that exist only within the world of subjective experience as an agent with intention, making choices within reality. If you limit yourself to only the perspective of reality that science gives us, then there is no basis for comparing certain phenomenon against others in order to determine and organize according to a specific value. To hold worldview 1001 as primary is to shoot yourself in the foot by taking more off of the table than you might have imagined. Because science doesn't have value within it. Even staying within the domain of science, in order for us to even find a good reason to seek out a scientific understanding of, a, or of certain aspects of the world, we must first find the potential information to be valuable to us as subjective beings. For instance, it would be a perfectly scientific endeavor for me to analyze and tabulate every grass clipping from my lawn. 
But to expend the energy to bother doing any of that would be a complete waste of my time. I'd much rather force myself to finish a book that I need to get through. You see, our expectations for how we wish the world to become affects our choices for looking at what we do not yet understand. So before we can even begin to cre create new scientific facts, we have to have value for the possibility of what those facts can bring us. Now, Sam Harris and certain others are attempting to create an understanding of the world with human experiences re-included back into the picture. It's a scientific fact now that there are people that are experiencing pain and suffering. And so we use our inbuilt preference against pain to recognize that it's a negative. And we can use our Worldview 1001 in order to best tell us how to further the only thing worth valuing the well-being of conscious creatures, as stated by Sam Harris in The Moral Landscape. He goes even further by saying, it's the only thing people should value. <laughs> saying it as if people have the capacity to choose between and change the different values that they might already hold. But, see, there's a problem with this. What if a scientific fact causes a human subject to experience suffering? Does that now make the scientific fact non-valuable? If human well-being is the only thing we should value, is a lie that furthers well-being what we ought to hold ourselves to, rather than the truth that commits us into suffering? It's essentially bringing, bringing back Nietzsche's objections to Christian faith. Insofar as well-being is the only thing we must value, we would then have to create fictions in order to achieve that goal. And since truth is that which breaks through our false realities and causes us to suffer, we would then have to avoid the truth and reality. Now, Nietzsche would instead say that we must look where we experience the most suffering in order to find the truth that can help us to overcome it. Otherwise, we'd be resorting to living within a dying illusion. Now, a priori knowledge. The rationalists still have their point. The end results of a phenomenon, knowledgeable of via science, can then be looked at through the values that we already hold and share. Potential values such as the continuation of the species, or the well-being of conscious creatures, or a stable and socially cohesive society. And we can discern whether or not the phenomenon aids in the furthering of those values. But the problem is, we can't even know which values we currently hold and there are all, that the many that are always in competition with one another. Which of those values should take precedence over the others? What values should we sacrifice in the furthering of others? When we're making decisions, we cannot know a priori which of the facts we do not know, no, which of the facts we do know will actually lead to the ideal result that we desire. This is Taleb's Greenwood problem again. It's only after the fact that our it's only after we act out our predictions in uncertainty can we discover whether our knowledge is sufficient at attaining the desired results. We, we might even be performing extemporaneous rituals that have no causal link at all to the actual uh, desired result. But those rituals might still be psychologically reinforcing for that behavior that leads to the positive result. The, those superfluous rituals might be a more effective enforcer than sheer willpower or objective rationality for reasons that we might not even fully understand yet, such as hypnotism or um, the placebo effect, things like that. And of course, the response can be made by the rationalist that the only way that we could know and we could discover the reasons for why certain heuristics and rituals are necessary or preferable in the keeping in keeping them is by running tests to discover what does and what doesn't work. But of course the problem is, if something works, that means that we have a pre-assigned conception of what the expected result should be. And the belief that the result is really beneficial is one that might be actually proven false, given enough of an evolutionary time span, as many of the values that we've held before in the past have come to light about. So, in conclusion, we rely upon metaphorical truth because scientific truth is insufficient. We cannot derive an ought from an is without first imposing a highest value into the equation. 
value is something not physically or scientifically observable or falsifiable. Thus, within a purely scientific framework, value does not exist. But, of course, being subjective organisms, we cannot see and interact with the world without having a value framework built or learned into us to direct us in our action, in our choices. We must figure out, how, then, how to discover which values we ought to hold. I'll leave you with a clip from uh, an inter interview regarding Peterson's position. Really, the entire conversation is quite excellent, so you should check out the full thing. And I'll include all of the links to the videos that I've used below. Um, thank you all for watching. Well, no, one, no other creature has science. It's like they did perfectly well without it. Maybe science is fatal. I mean, it could easily be fatal. So, you know, and, and, and someone who's a scientist in the sort of ideological sense would say, well, even if it's fatal, it was still true. It's like, well, it depends on how you define truth. Like, if you're willing to say that fatal is true, well, then go ahead. But I think that's a, not a good definition of truth. And that's where our, our disagreement really lies. You have your definition, and I have my definition.